My name is Oswaldo. And I'm Will. And you know about bread, right? What do you? I don't know. I don't think you do. You know, everyone knows about bread, but do you really, really know about bread? That's why we got a little something special cooking for you. Yeah, see, today we're gonna document the long and storied history of bread, almost like a documentary. I guess you could say it's a documentary on the history of sliced bread. The long history of bread started around 8,000 BC in the Middle East, specifically Egypt. Bread at humble beginnings has basically just ground up flour mixed with water cooked on a hot rock. It was closer to a tortilla than bread, but I mean, <laughs> if I'm being honest, what is a tortilla but flat bread? The first sourdough bread was invented in Egypt in part by the skills in brewing alcohol, which is the main ingredient in making sourdough bread. Talk about a fun fact. Bread spread the world like wildfire, either through trade, conquest, or just plain dumb luck. Bread ended up everywhere. Bread evolved along with its new home, often being made with grain that originated from those areas. Bread became as varied as the people who ate it. At this point, bread was only made unleavened, meaning that it was made without a leavening agent like yeast or baking powder. This is essentially the difference between tortillas, flatbreads, and leavened bread like pastries, bread loaves, and most of the bread we eat today. You know? Come on, guys. Leavened, like its unleavened counterpart, was first created by the ancient Egyptians. It's not quite clear when exactly bread became something more resembling modern bread. It's actually been debated for a very long time, but it's speculated to not have been very long after the discovery of unleavened bread. The prevailing theory is that some Egyptian baker left their dough at for some time, and in that time, while yeast cells cultivated in the dough, and when it was baked, the bread was risen and thus softer. This new form of bread quickly grew popular and has since been developed into hundreds of different forms. Now skip about mm, 9,000 years and BAM! One of the most common forms of bread today will be invented. That is the majestic, the amazing Pullman loaf. Our more savvy breadologists may recognize this as that there sandwich bread, and they'd be correct because it is. The Pullman loaf was first developed in the late 1700s to early 1800s. They were, quite fittingly, first used in the kitchens of Pullman rail cars. And that's where they got their name, along with the hilarious observation that they were sort of shaped like little, little rail cars. Nowadays, the Pullman loaf is more commonly known as simply the sandwich lo loaf, since it's extremely satisfying square shape. It's well suited for cramming stuff on top of each other in a compact rectangular prism and being like, <sighs> <clears throat> <clears throat> Sliced bread section. <laughs> now, at this point, you must be wondering, hey, where's the sliced bread? I only came here for the sliced bread. Well, impatient viewers, this is for you. If you really think about it, the fact that we're only just now bringing up sliced bread must be weird. Like, it couldn't have taken people 8,000 years to figure out you can turn bread into smaller pieces. And you'd be right, sliced bread existed since bread has existed, but what we're here to discuss is the sliced bread most of us know today. And that's machine sliced bread. See, in modern times, nary a soul slices their own bread. It all comes nice and pre-sliced and in a convenient plastic bag. The technology for this was invented uh, in 1928 by one Otto Frederick Rowetter of Davenport, Iowa. He actually had a prototype as early as 1912, but due to an unfortunate bout of on-fire house syndrome, that prototype was destroyed. It wasn't until 1928 that Rowetter actually had an act a working bread machine. Later that year, Chillicothe Baking Company of Chillicothe, Missouri, were the first ones to utilize Rowetter's bread slicing machine. From this point on, sliced bread exploded in popularity. By the 1950s, about 80% of bread sold was sliced. Here's our expert. His name is Andrew, and he's a Food City baker. So, tell me a little about your bread making operation here in this grocery store. 
Well, in the mornings, we prepare a ton of dough. There's different kinds for different bread, but the most common is batard. What's batard? Batard is pretty much just, it's just a name for oval-shaped bread. We make a lot of it, and we have different types depending on the type of flour we use. All right, so what comes after you make the dough? Well, we cut the dough and then we put it in the proofing room. What's that? Um, the proofing room, it's pretty much just a, it's a clean, warm room that we put the raw dough in so it can rise. Alrighty, so what comes after that? Well, uh, after that, uh, it takes like three hours in the proofing room. We go ahead and we start to actually assemble the bread. Um, we put whatever we need on top of it or inside of it. Uh, like, like the cheese bread, for instance, uh, where we take some cheddar cheese and we just sprinkle some of it on top. And after that, we bake them in these giant bread ovens that can bake like uh, 30 or so at a time. Wow, that's a ton. Yep, and we do that a couple times until all the bread is ready, and then we move on to pastries. Why do you wait until then to start the pastries? Well, the pastries, um, they don't last that long. They tend to go bad more quickly than the other stuff, like the regular bread. So we like to have it nice and fresh by the time the customers come in. Oh, all right, that makes sense. Okay, well, thanks for all the info. Bye, bye, bye. Thank you. January 18th, 1943. Tragedy struck. Bam, bam! Claude R. Wicker, an evil man. He was the Secretary of Agriculture. Ordered a ban on machine sliced bread. This is due to the fact that plastic rationing, as well as an attempt to stop the rise of bread prices. Nonetheless, the public was outraged. The modern American had grown too far accustomed to their pre sliced bread, and they weren't happy about this new ban. There were outraged cries from bread eaters, the loudest of which were the mothers. The mothers. Ah. They complained that they were cutting far too much bread to feed their family. And to be fair, the amount of bread Americans were consuming was astonishing. Due to sliced bread's ease of use, people ate more of it, and more of it, and more of it. This resulted in America's household eating as many as three loaves of bread a day. That's insane. Can you believe it? I can't. Cutting that much was simply too much for American mothers. It seemed as though the public's outcry was effective, as not three months later, the ban was rescinded, and bakeries were once again allowed to sell pre-sliced bread. Truly a heartwarming story. Some interesting stories in the great tale of bread are its many, many incarnations. From big to small, long and short, plain and elaborate, these are their stories. Cornbread, as we know it today, is a southern staple. Uh, it's eaten just about every circumstance. Breakfast, lunch, and dinner, cornbread has found its use in all of these meals. No southern favorite is complete without a healthy serving of corned bread. But did you know that cornbread isn't actually an American invention? That's right. Probably America's most stereotypical food item, like just about everything else about it, was stolen from someone else. See, cornbread was actually invented by U.S. Native Americans. It, unsurprisingly, is made out of corn. Native Americans were really good at growing and eating corn. I mean, they made bread out of it. Sounds crazy, but they did. Cornbread grew popular because of how easy it was to make. Mostly just some spices, ground up corn, and a bit of water. So it became a staple food for early European settlers who tended to have trouble finding reliable sources of food. Cornbread was particularly popular in southern colonies. Ah, see, now the pieces are coming together. Yep, cornbread fought itself in southern colonies and just kind of stayed there, pretty much being unchanged. It just hanged around being eaten by just about every southern household. Whether you think it's a delectable snack or just tastes like wet sand, cornbread is undoubtedly a staple food item and it's not going anywhere anytime soon. Gingerbread. It's bread made with ginger. <laughs> Wait a second, that weird crust brown root? Yep. Well, to be specific, it's flavored with it. Gingerbread, it, it, it's sort of a misnomer, if you will. It makes it sound like that weird crust brown root is the main ingredient, when for the most part, it's not. It just adds a hint of ginger flavor. 
And for its credit, it does give it a fairly unique taste, but if it was just ginger, then it tastes kind of like root beer bread, which... Bleh. Gingerbread originated in Greece. There's record of it being brought to France by an American monk by the name of Gregory of Nicopolis. And that's how it got to Europe, where it was most popular. Now at this point, gingerbread was actually more like bread than cookies that you'd see today. It was dense, chewy, and it tasted very little like today's yummy sugar bread. The main similarity is the ginger. Classic gingerbread tasted quite a lot of ginger. It had many different spices, including, but not limited to, pepper, ground cinnamon, ground ginger, ground allspice, ground nutmeg, ground cloves, cardamom, and ground coriander. And for the most part, these spices are still present in modern gingerbread. Enter sugar. When people started adding sugar to gingerbread, everything changed. Gingerbread became sugar bread, kind of like everything else, actually. Granted, it started out slowly, mostly because sugar was expensive, you know. But over time, as sugar got cheaper, people added more and more to gingerbread. The ginger and gingerbread became more of a footnote in its main flavor profile. And all the other flavor spices, pff, forget about it. Not to mention what happened to it when it arrived to the United States. At that point, it was all over for ginger. Now, we'd be remiss if we didn't mention the red cloth jelly, jelly elephant in the room. Yeah. I'm talking about Christmas. Now, the role that gingerbread plays during Christmas is a fairly small one, but a consistent one nonetheless. See, in most countries that celebrate Christmas, gingerbread is a common dessert item. But the reason for that is that it's fairly boring. Gingerbread was just a tasty snack. In Europe, people ate gingerbread outside of Christmas and during various different holidays. The only re reason gingerbread is such a staple item for Christmas is because of the good old U.S. of A. See, we Americans saw cool European stuff and we stuck it in our own little in our own traditions like a hundred years ago. Before that, gingerbread was little had little importance in Christmas besides being a cannibal's favorite snack. Ah, yes, the humble baguette, the long loaf the French's choice weapon of war, the world's deadliest pastry. It's kind of just long bread, but it's actually more interesting than that. The origin of the baguette is mostly speculation. Stick-shaped bread sort of just popped up during the 18th century, and it wasn't until the early 1900s that the word baguette was coined. By the way, baguette literally means stick or baton in French. Neat. Anywho, France is well known for its bread, so what makes the baguette such a national icon? Well, there are two main reasons. Number one, it just got super popular. I, I know that's pretty lame, but it's really as simple as that. See, bread was already France's whole thing when baguettes were invented, so naturally, the most popular bread would become one of France's best known things. The second reason is because of all the silly myths surrounding baguettes, such as Napoleon Bonaparte requesting a stick-shaped bread that could be transported more easily in the event of a long march. Or that French metro workers were apparently too violent, so they had their knives taken away from them. But due to that, they couldn't cut their bread. Oh my. So the baguette was created as an easily pulled apart solution. Really, there's no obvious reason that baguettes became such a cultural icon in France. Just chalk it up to being in the right place at the right time. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for watching the history of bread. I think it was pretty educational. But well, I know I liked it. I hope you all learned something more about bread. I know I did. And I hope you learned to appreciate everything that's led up to what you're eating every day. Yep, ladies and gentlemen, you might not realize this, but bread is pretty important in your life. So without it, where would we be? Breadless, basically just breadless monkeys. True that. That's that, yeah.